maybe, maybe not. Yeah. So we've got a, a few people here, which is good. It'll give uh, an opportunity to kind of hopefully do a little brainstorming. Um, trying to think about where the best way to kind of start this conversation is at. And I think probably with the idea of structures, um, a lot of the work that we do as administrators within the, the district is about building structures. You build a structure, you give it some time, you let it exert its influence. If it's a good structure, it starts to produce what you want it to. If it's uh, not a good structure, then you change things to kind of make things fit. And so there's been a lot of structures that have been put in place over the last couple of years um, that have been very specifically targeted at student learning. Um, you know, this year alone within the, the high school, they've got the extension classes um, where students that have gaps in learning, um, those gaps have been, been identified using our assessment systems. Um, so what they do is they take their regular math class that they would in the grade that they're, they're normally in, but they have another class that the teachers have been fabulous in. We were in taking a look at the, the, the classes the other day where they analyze the students' needs and prepare plans and specifically teach those skills to get the students caught up in their gaps. And again, you build these structures and over time, you know, hopefully they exert the influence that you want. And so one of the things that we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, and I'm going to start completely from scratch with this. Um, sometimes what I do is I kind of prepare kind of a draft of, of, uh, of an idea or a policy or a structure and then have people rip it apart. But this time what I want to do is just start kind of blank slate. Um, the question is... At the end of the school year, what do we do for students that have not met the standards? So in other words, if you were supposed to learn these 50 things by the end of fourth grade, and we get to the end of the year, and I can only confidently say that you know 25, what do I do? And one of the reasons that I'm bringing this up is the structures that we built, like the extension classes in mathematics, those are in place to fix just that problem just later on down the line. In other words, what it appeared was kind of happening in the district was students at one level weren't quite meeting the standards, they had gaps in their knowledge, they were moved on to the next level, they might get some gaps there. And by the time they got up to middle school, high school, there were a lot of gaps in knowledge that they had and we've been scrambling around trying to figure out ways to fill in those gaps before they graduate. Easier solution is to make sure that they've got it. And so, you know, traditionally, you know, some schools hold students back. Some, some schools advance them regardless of. And the research is mixed on what the best thing is to do. Um, really, the only clear research that I am familiar with in the last couple of years um, has to do with holding back middle school students. In middle school, um, if you hold back a student at, in those grades, they are much more likely to drop out. So that's the only clear research on it. So with that, I've given you a problem, and your job is to give me some ideas as we try to figure out a structure that's going to help these students. I talked about this some earlier this week with Lisa, so I've heard some ideas. One idea, well, one successful idea last year was a new summer program for certain students who were behind in reading and writing. Um, did some independent learning over the summer, and they were able to significantly pick up some of their um, standards. Yeah. Because they did reading and writing, and it actually got, I think it got picked up in the Herald, and I think they interviewed some people and did stories themselves. Yeah. Um, so so we, we've had a it's, a, it's a good point. We've been able to benefit a lot um, from the ESSER funding. So a couple of things that we did build, we built the, the summer programming, we've got after school programming. I think you're gonna be uh, our homework club coach, it sounds like, so that's wonderful. Um, and so those structures are designed to help, you know, we use the, the testing systems to figure out what the students are missing and then these programs um, help build that up. I think we had 66 elementary students too in the summer, summer program. Um, trying to catch up on those academics. Yeah, the summer program um, wasn't independent. It was led by one of our oh, teachers. Right. Yeah. And it could either be taken for enrichment or academic um, recovery. 
and the academic recovery expectations were higher. Yeah. Right. So it could it was a journalism class, and we'd like to build more of that. You know, um, that's really the tip of the iceberg, as you would say, of what we might do. So if we build this structure, right? Right now we've got grant money that, that's funding it. If people feel this is a good structure, it's something that we could try to build into the regular budget. And what this structure would look like is, hey, students, if you do not meet the standards at the end of the year, the expectation is, is that you are going to take advantage of this programming so that you are caught up before the next year starts. Does that make a little bit of sense? Or am I misreading what folks are thinking? Go ahead. No, I'm just feeling like you almost need tears because someone might be close mm -hmm. and others are miles away. And so if that's the case, they may need the, the top, like multiple weeks in the summer. Where is the schedule this year? What was helpful in the past, and it might have even been pre-COVID now because the years are a blur really since then. Right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, where if every, Whoever was caught up on their work was usually out well, almost like a week of school days early, right? And then the other kids continued to come in. Mm -hmm. And that served a purpose. And they worked really hard because they didn't want to be here all those five days, right? At first, they're like, they're not really going to do anything. And then as they came in, they were like, oh, yeah, we do have to do this work and worked hard. And then as it fell off, the last day, you might not have any students when you started with 20. I'm mostly middle, I'm talking middle school kids. Um, so again, tiered support. And when you say structure, do you mean a structure over the entire school year? Or are you only saying a structure to address problems at the end of the school year when, OK, you still are not proficient. So, so we have structures that are built within the school year, right? So they do the Track My Progress, they do the STAR 360 three times a year. Based upon that data, they can identify students that at that point in time are a little behind where they should be. And a lot of, the, especially the elementaries and the high school a little bit as well, they have additional time on learning spaces, we can call them, where the students will be assigned to to go and spend some time and try to get those skills during the school year. But it's not always successful. Some students can be re can be resistant, or you know, there's not a good connection. What do we do? Because we've got this responsibility to make sure that they've all got the foundational knowledge that they need. What do we do as as policy? That'll be the structure as policy. What do we do when a student doesn't meet that standard? And so one of the good, good ideas is, you know, we've got the potential for summer programming, we've got after school programming, but what other things? And then if you could have those weeks, that week of time, that could be the lower tiered because they would get get the work done in that amount of time. But you also, are they not proficient because high absenteeism, um, no, no support at home. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's not like one answer and it's multi-layered. I think about the week <clears throat> that we always had for recovery at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the students that didn't work through the year and thought either A, they could do a year's worth of work in a, in a week, or B, they never did it anyway, why would they do it in that week? And they only saw it as punitive. So you're right, I that whole you know, you have to investigate really what what was the background of the reason right. that they weren't successful. Yeah. But most were successful in that plan. What what kinds of numbers are we talking about? How many students approximately are we talking about? Math or English? Both. So more if half. we if more than it's half. more than half the school, if you look at I mean, with the proficiency. That's what I was just about we're to say. We're less than 50% for proficient in both of those. Well, it, dep it, dep it depends on the school. So, like, some of the elementary schools are pushing 70% proficiency. 
Um, high school, depending upon whether it's math or whether it's, it's ELA, it's higher and lower. Um, but, you know, in general, I'd say, you know, 50, 55-ish um, are hitting proficiency, which means 50, 45 percent are not. Um, so it's a significant number. And that's true across the state of Vermont. But again, if we're trying to make sure that, especially with a course um, that's successive like math, where if I don't know what happened in algebra, um, or I'm missing big gaps in algebra one, how the heck am I going to do algebra two? And you know, if I have a plan on going off and being an engineer and, and take calculus, um, right? Calculus is usually the first two steps of the problem. The rest of it's the algebra cleanup. Um, so. That's why this is, I think, is an important conversation to have. And then the tougher conversation is, is if we come up with a solution, you know, do we make it mandatory? Right. I think if students know summer school is going to be mandatory, that might be a little bit of motivation to put the work in during the regular school year if they really want their summers to be free. Um, I like the idea of it not necessarily being the entire summer, depending on how proficient you are or how much help you need to get caught up. Maybe it's half a summer. Maybe it's a certain amount of weeks. Yeah, because we can figure out the specific skills. Right? That's what the assessments are good for. You know what they need to work on. I like the idea of putting it immediately right at the end. Mm -hmm. Like, so there's no break. That seems like it would. You have to make it appealing. And it has to be a little different because it can't be the right. same same structure right. as <clears throat> far as the teaching methods because that didn't work. Right. You can get creative and still meet proficiency. Hopefully. I'm not saying I'm okay, I have those skills, but I, <laughs> we have people who can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, it'd be smaller groups, right? So it could be more focused. Yeah. Smaller groups are usually more successful, right? I don't know. Yes, that, that's absolutely yeah. right. I would say that's true. Like even when we did have a summer program when Michelle and I and Carrie Hazard did it for two summers, we had like 12 kids. Yeah. And, and they all, and that was before proficiency based, but they, they all owed quite a bit of work, but we were creative in how we did it and they, they embraced it. Yeah. So. Well, and it was, it was a great program where kids you know, really got to, you know, build those relationships and enjoy being here, and and I think it it was it was a beautiful program. The po a positive connection to school has got to be, and that was one, yeah, right? that was. Yeah, really so it's not you know yeah you you, you got to do it, but it's not because it's punitive. You've got to do it because it's important and we care about you. Yeah, and we're going to do what we can. And, and, and you want to be successful, and we want to support you in that. And when we had field trips in that, where some of those students had never gone further than West Lab or the Berlin Mall, right? And you, there, there can be some proficiency-based learning on field trips, too. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So make it high interest mm -hmm. and a lot of social-emotional support. Mm -hmm. They made their breakfast together, lunch together, yes. Oh, that's yeah. nice, because there's math there, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. There's math everywhere, right, Betty? <laughs> <laughs> so the the other piece is so and make sure and this is this you gotta correct me because I am taking my notes and they're, they're they're only as good as my fingers can type. Um, we've got a talking about a structure where the students at the end of the year, right, if there's if there's significant deficiencies, significant things they still need to learn, significant standards to meet. They stay right at the end of the year and continue on, right? And we differentiate it, right? If you if it only takes you two weeks to get what you need, you know that's that's where you exit. If it takes longer than that, you know that's fine too. We we carry you through. What do we do though if we get to a situation where yeah, we offered this to you, we provided transportation, we set it up, everything is structured for you, and you just decided you weren't going to be there or whatnot? You don't want to be asking me that because. I'm old school. Well, that's natural, why I'm asking. Cause... Natural consequences. We gave you, you know, we sent the helicopter. You did not climb off. Yep. We sent the boat. You didn't get in. And then we sent someone swimming to you, and you said no. Yeah. At that point, I really feel like we have no. 
I mean, I've talked with students about that before. Do you really want to take a ninth grade English and a tenth grade English if you don't like English? Yeah. You know, just that kind of. So I think you'll you'll have to continue to have those conversations, and you can have them in positive ways. Yeah. But is there is there a general feeling amongst at least those of us that are here that you know? If we build this structure, if we provide them every opportunity, we provide transportation, and you just don't take advantage of it, that either in the course, if it's high school, or potentially in the grade, if it's elementary school, you're held back. And then if we hold you back, do we build structures during the current year that you're in that might help you get caught up and regain the grade that you lost during the next year? I, I, I won't speak to elementary because that's different. Like holding them yeah. back is totally different. I think you're not proficient in English 9, then you have to take English 9 again. Unless there's an embedded English credit in some other classes that, that we can find or something like that. So if we stick with the high school piece, what are the folks think? High school people, what do you think? Well, we, <clears throat> when I talked to Lisa about this a few days ago, there were other strategies we talked about. So like English 9 didn't work out for them. Maybe there's um, a different English class that they could try, different teacher they could try to connect with. That's not always successful either. And she brought up the point where you can't just keep holding kids back either. Like kids graduate all the time when they're not proficient with everything. You, you can't have a... 30 year old freshman, right? Like, there's got to be a cutoff point at some point. I don't know, and I don't know where that cutoff point is. One of the strategies we had during the normal school year would be um, take some of the faster students and match them or pair them and let them be teacher's assistants. And um, because kids sometimes who are struggling to keep up or hear from the adult teacher, maybe, maybe they'll hear it when they hear it a second time from a peer, maybe that'll be helpful. And a lot of the other parents there kind of spoke up and said, yeah, that's actually how I learned. So-and-so was really good in math, and he kind of helped all of us. Or, or in English, so-and-so helped us get through. That so. yeah, kind of makes sense. Um, right? if, I'm, if I've just learned it myself, I can remember the tricks and the thoughts the that were going through my yeah. mind to be able to grasp it. And, yeah. and you're going to reword it in the teenage lingo, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I, I, Marcus did a lot of that, but I don't think it was always recognized. So one idea I gave Lisa was the, like, maybe find a formal way of recognizing that so somebody like a Marcus could um, get a little bit of credit. Maybe it's on his transcript or something. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was a great skill set for Marcus to learn because he came out of a shell and he was speaking with more students he wouldn't normally speak with. And uh, so it was good for him, too. And it reinforced his learning of the material because he was turning around and had to explain it to people. So um, like, like a formal teacher's assistant, I think, would be a good opportunity. So I, like, I like the idea of having the credit to it. Yeah, no, I'm actually glad. I'm glad folks are talking about it, because it's been, I've asked um, the principals of their advisory groups to start the discussions as well. And then we're going to pool all the information that we get together to figure out how to build this the best way that we can. That's really a structure that could be in every class. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to, like, that could, a well-managed class, the teacher could recognize that. Right and once a week or something you work in groups and you can strategically pair up the groups yeah so you could start that during the school year also other thoughts you've been you've been here forever you gotta have some thoughts I don't know. well i'll take yeah. a minute i know it's a no it's i mean it's interesting I, um yeah, you know, obviously these are things that we've been wrestling with for yeah. all the years that we've been here, and and so, um, yeah, I do. I wonder if I, you know um, people have bandied about the idea of a J term, like a January or a June term, and I know it cuts away a little bit from like instructional time, but June can be a little gnarly anyway. So explain, explain what that would look like. So it would be like the school year ends around June, you know, the formal classes end around June 1st. The grading. Yeah, yeah, grading. the grading or like English 9 ends at June 1st. Yeah. And then we have three weeks to teach an intensive course, yeah. um, you know, where rather than, you know, the, teaching the five or six classes that I'm teaching normally, it's like, okay, I can do a class intensely on, you know, whatever, you know, whatever interests students and the teacher say. 
So, you know, we could have a, a you know, a one week or two week class on paper airplane building and design mm -hmm. or, you know, or, or, you know, um, cooking in different cultures or, you know, hiking or something where you might be able to get at the, the skills in a different way um, so that, um, you know, I'm thinking about the students that aren't as successful and, you know, the, the problem is still primarily one of engagement. You know, why, like, why am I doing this? You know, um, you know, okay, you know, I, I, you know, a combination of, and where does that lack of engagement come from? You know, part of it is probably lack of confidence. I'm not a confident reader, and you're just giving me this text, and I have to read it, so I'm gonna try and do everything in my power to get out of it. <laughs> Whether that's escape to the, es escape wherever I can escape, or, pretend to be asleep, you know, whatever it is, or be disruptive. Um, but if, you know, I think the more opportunities we have to sort of come in from the side and be like, you know, hey, you know, let's, let's do a course in games, game, do a course in game design. And I know that game design, you know, people use that as part of their teaching. It's not that classes are, we, we sit and, you know, do math every day, you know, math worksheets every day, but but sometimes a, a change of context can can maybe help. And I don't know, it's it's been an idea that's been bandied about. I know it's also like less instructional time, so you know, it, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. But I feel like June's kind of a wash anyway, so yeah, it's it's a thought, and, it's, and it could be yeah. like a J term. J term half days, and if you're and if you haven't done your work and you bombed the whole year, it's like oh, you only can do J term in the afternoons, and you have to like make up your work in the morning, something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know, um, and I, I I can see advantages and disadvantages to that, but it's a thought. No, it's actually good ideas. You, you can present that in a positive light, right? Because then you're telling the students who have basically been screaming their hands-on learners and all of that, right. that we heard you and we're, we're giving you another tool to be successful. And, you know, and have some student choice in it too, you know. I, um, it, like Ted and I would always joke that we would, we would teach a class of time travel you know, or, or something like that, but to have students generate ideas like, oh, I want to learn more about, like, you know, how a car works or whatever. Like, so you know, Northfield do does a, or they, for a while they were doing this thing, it was called like the Yes Plan. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that sort of thing. So I wonder if you could check in with them to see. Yeah, Springfield how. used to have a, what was called intercession too. Where they, they actually did it in the middle of the school year, which was a yeah. little different. Northfield did it at the end of the school year, yeah. uh, pre COVID. I don't know if they've continued it or not, but pre COVID they were doing it. Was this. that like for all grades yes. or was that just high school? It was uh, just for the high school, middle school. I can talk with Matt Fetters to see what's happening right there. Yeah. Other ideas, and I know this is a really broad. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of topic. Be interested what the kids would say. Yeah. If and when, yeah. if and when you ask them. Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. What do you need to be successful? What what are you know? I can't remember if we have student council or other types of leadership that you could throw that out to or are they working on it? Yeah, they Because I, I had asked that they all, yeah. And, and at least at the high school, I can't speak for the elementary schools, but at um, but the high school, they uh, do have sort of a, I mean, we've had iterations in the past, but we've sort of got a new fledgling student or leadership maybe even core. Doing focus group with maybe kids who are not engaging and True. not, mm -hmm. and because the kids who are going to be in the leadership group are probably the kids who are engaged in We're school doing and yeah. they're yeah. doing their stuff. So they're yeah. going to be like, you're asking me to, I, uh, I don't know. But, right, right. but if you actually did a focus group with the kids who are struggling or who are disengaged, what, what do you need? What's, what would be helpful? Yeah, I, I would, I would. Chris, you know what was interesting? was the extension classes. Mm -hmm. Those kids were doing math. 
but on their own independently and so it was like was it just the structure of this class that I, and they were good i mean you know for for being put in there because you're missing skills they were doing well part of the issue is the students assigned to that class are assigned um in august september yeah they've shown some of those students have shown massive growth well have shown in fact prowess that they didn't show on the last test last year. Yeah. And so some of those students should be released from that extension class, yeah. but we're driven by schedule. Yeah. And so they're in the extension class. My concern about a J uh, term um, is that you've got students that are not feeling successful for too long yeah. before they get to a J term or an alternative no, choice. That's, true. Mm. that's a good point. Mm -hmm. that's a problem. Can you explain what's this extension? Mm. Yeah, um, let's go. These are students that are not. Um, on grade, grade level. level. Is this elementary through high school? We just have it right now with grades 7, 8, and 9. Okay. I, I have to admit that I wanted it 7, 8, 9, 10. Mm -hmm. But our grades, our grade 10 has very small groups, and so we're hoping that they can be, this can be addressed within the class. But when they're grade level below and your class is teaching grade level, mm -hmm. it's really hard to get back to the gaps and the holes while you're still trying to keep everybody moving forward. So I really think that, and, and I voiced this, um, I really think we need to look at that again. So the extension is a double map. They have math twice. Except twice. that the, the extension class is looking specifically at what the gaps are. Mm -hmm. At what we've used the data that we've, we've uh, gleaned from both star math and we're using a pilot of IXL for math. So we have to, to uh, diagnose what's going on mm -hmm. content wise, but not necessarily executive function and not necessarily the, um, the social-emotional. Yeah. Is that during both the school year and the school day, or is it outside of? It's during the school day. Okay. So they're losing an elective. Okay. But they're getting credit for the extension. This is the first okay. year that they've gotten some credit for extension. It's a great use of elective time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We, um, this is a model um, that we did it at Marblehead. Um, actually, they take it back. We did it at Swampscott. Um, they did not have as many pipeline, what I call the pipeline students, students that had a number of years of kind of missing skills along the way. Um, within two years, we didn't need them anymore. I don't know if that'll be the case here, because Betty's point is, is incredibly valid in terms of it is very hard. If I'm missing skills and I'm taking my current math class that I'm supposed to be in and still working on the skills at the time, right? I'm, might, I'm still going to be having trouble in my current math class, where the better, better solution is making sure they've got the, kit, the skills before that starts, mm -hmm. which is part of some of the things that we were discussing earlier. Well, yeah, yeah. that's kind of what I've been working on for a number of years now. And thankfully, of course, COVID had to interrupt most of it. But we now have. Um, vertical alignment, consistent programming and curriculum from pre-K to 12. But we've only gotten that to a, to a good degree of recognition. This is our second year. Always, be, every time we tried to do it, we got interrupted. But he, he didn't help last year. And, no. yeah. mm -hmm. but, but the consistency is there, and we won't necessarily see it for three to five years. Um, and we're really in our second year. And, and actually, our scores have shown. Relative, so relative to the, the districts around us. You know, the scores are low from what I'm used to seeing in Massachusetts, but relative to the schools around us, we're beating the pants off them. And the scores are low 
compared to what I saw in the past when we were using yeah. portfolio and we were all working with grassroots trainings yeah. two or three times a year together. Mm -hmm. And we're not necessarily doing that anymore. Yeah. Is this our second year of having the, the consistent curriculum or the second year of doing extension? Second year of consistent curriculum? Okay. We've had in the past um, specialized what we call math labs, and they were driven by data, um, but again, hampered by schedule. And um, in those labs, they were uh, launched, they were uh, foundational skills, but we also included support for the class that they were also taking. And we didn't have credit given for, for that. I, I couldn't even get um, habits credit. Do we have extension for other subjects? English, so the the two the two core ones. Uh, again, and, and a lot of it, the idea was uh, as the curriculum. So the the elementary school had a had a fairly solid curriculum in ELA. They had a, a curriculum in math that they were kind of using. S in parts and pieces. And so they got things aligned and, and running first, and then the focus has been on the high school, and they've kind of done the same thing. They've done a really good job the last couple of years, to be honest. Um, but ELA um, is kind of on the same pathway, so they've got, a, they've got a double. And it's kind of funny, you know, usually the kids that are got some holes in terms of math also have holes in English. And so the way that they were moving the students around to make sure that they were able to access both without eating up their entire schedule was pretty it's good. It's really nice to see yeah. the teamwork with the teachers. And it's an hour long class mm -hmm. this year. And really, when you're, when you're intervening or you're trying to target specific skills, you don't need an hour on it. You need a mini lesson so that it can be tried and practiced and worked around a little bit. You need it often, but an hour on one skill is when they're already doing another hour elsewhere. You know, it's, it's hard. So it's an hour every day extension? And how many kids are four assigned days. extension four days? Well, doing four? Uh, well, if it's the first period, it's 40 minutes, so yeah. it's five days, because that's static, the yeah. first and second. Oh, but that's right, because we're schedule. Yeah. It's a waterfall, so that there is one day that you miss it. And how many kids are being sent to extension for assigned to? The, the, we went through what, three, four, four classes, about yeah. six kids per class? The, no, the full cohort was about yeah. 12 to 15, but um, many of them were cut in, in half. ELA. Cut in half to do half were in ELA and half were in math. And then they switched during the period. So some days, come in. If Betsy Shans explained that some days they have all 12 or 14 students, and then other days they'll only have half. Well, 12 students per grade? Like, still there's 12 seventh graders doing this right that now? That was what they could get because of schedule. Right. So um, I recommended in ninth grade, on my, on my first list, I had uh, 26 mm -hmm. on ninth grade, right. but they couldn't all get into that. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and, and even when there is one group, I think that's 21 or two, it's split in half this way. So is there a way of expanding extension since it sounds like we're getting, I can't do the math in my head, but 12 students out of what's our average grade size, 60, 70? 60, yeah. So that's 20% less yeah. than 20% are going when we know we want 50% improving their proficiency. So nice. do we do an extra period after class? Like, I don't know, how do you build in extension for more kids? Or is that oh, you, you could, it just it eats it, it'll eat into the electives. That's, that's the only problem. I mean, we could do it now. Um, we'd probably need more math teachers. Um, at we least are to, down one. Yeah, we need at least teacher. another math teacher to be able to and make it work. And we're down one interventionist. Yep. So, um, so that also hampered some of our yeah. selection this year. It would be okay. great if midterm they could test out and, and go into an art class or a music class. Do they know that? My, my impression was... Currently, in, I don't think we're doing that, are we? My impression... We don't have a place to send them. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, because of the schedule piece. Yeah, because that was the that was the original mm -hmm. intent because we have the track by progress in the Star 360, right? We could take the assessments and when it looks like they met the skills and they no longer need it, right? Um, but I think I think she is correct by the sounds of things and it makes sense that the schedule is probably prohibitive. Right? Because I'm not sure I understand the scheduling prohibitive. If they test out halfway through a semester, so let's say you split the semester in half, couldn't they do an elective the other half of that semester? Uh, potentially, but if if my math extension is sitting here within the schedule, yep. the if I test out, the only other classes I could take are other classes that sit here in the schedule. And so it's it's happenstance whether it, there's an elective there or an elective they might want to take. Um, Unless we plan for there to be an elective there yeah. for those that test out. Yeah. And have them swap places with the ones that we knew are going to need it next, like who are on the right. second on the waiting okay. list. And the other thing that does is the ins it incentivizes yes. the student yes, to saying. work harder or, or to do what's been asked. If they know they're holding a spot for somebody else who needs it. Yeah. Well, that, but also if they know that if they reach this plateau that we've, we've described and we've defined, yeah. right? Yeah. Then they can be in an elective. Then they're out of here. And, you know, they're already feeling unsuccessful in math. And so now they're taking two hours worth of math. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, our, our instructors doing the extensions are um, pretty amazing um, for that situation because these are also students that are um, less motivated to do well or they're more challenging in the classroom. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, when, as, as you see them, or maybe you haven't seen this yet, but are you seeing that, that increase in self-esteem or? Because uh, of the instructors, there is more of that. Um, it's not necessarily due to the fact that now they're doing more math. It is that the math that they're doing during extension is mixed up, for instance. There's a, there's a launch, uh, which is like, do now, like the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what I did here in yeah, the beginning. Yeah. And then uh, a mini lesson mm -hmm. that everybody sort of needs. Mm -hmm. And then some a more fine-tuned work with IXL, which is a software that is also written for the Carnegie that they're using. So the models are and vocabulary, is, it's all similar. similar. Mm -hmm. So that's helpful. And IXL is also skill driven. So that particular software, if the student is still struggling with foundational calculation skills, for instance, IXL will target that for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, auto-adjusts. Yeah, and, and, um, and then the teachers um, are aware of the grade level that's being offered through the diagnostic testing. So, I, you know, I, I push language a lot. I want them to see let the kids use it, let the, let them be collaborative. So it isn't so much um, uh, procedural, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, they're really great teachers and scaffold intuitively mm -hmm. for the students. It's pretty impressive to watch. I, I just had... The, the, the coolest thing, um, and they, they were all doing it, but Betsy Shands was the one that, um, you know, because you want to you see what the kids are doing with the assessments and use that to plan the lessons that you're giving them so they're getting what they need. And so, you know, she, she came up and we were doing the walkthrough and she had the data out right in front of her in terms of what skills the students were working on, had it mapped out with what was happening this week and which things that she was working with them on. But it was based directly on what they need and that's exactly how that, that program should run and it was beautiful to see, it really was. Yeah. Yeah. Usually as a, as a student sort of begins to realize, oh, I, I actually, I got it. Like yeah. it's making sense now. Yeah. I, I wonder if they begin, if you begin to see those wheels start to turn, or is there too much other 
social emotional stuff. Yeah. There's, there's executive functioning. Let, just let's mix overall into the salad and a, a, adolescent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. and, you know who who also says. I'm determined to hate math, <laughs> you know, and they're going to stick to it, is yeah. my story. Yeah. Um, and, um, but yeah, I mean, there's light. There, there is, is light. a little bit of light. Okay. Yeah. And, and do we have, as the kids are coming up through, is this, is this a problem that we're going to see lessen as the elementary kids move their way through. That's why I keep getting hired. I'm hoping that's exactly what happens. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that would yeah. be. Well, the, the elementary scores are up. Yeah. I mean, the first step is, is making sure that, you know, we're doing the best we can in terms of the classroom instruction. And so that's mm -hmm. what all the curriculum work and things were about. And then once you build that, you know, especially the kids that are starting out, you know, preschool, kindergarten, because it goes all the way down to preschool. Um, they are getting more of what they need in each grade along the way so that by the time they get up to the middle school, high school, um, they should be in much better shape. And I will tell you that never before this year have I had so many teachers say, this is so great to use. Mm -hmm. I, we're do I, I can't believe all of my students are engaged. And I go in and they're, they're all collaborating, they're all engaged. This is one of them. He's right on it, <laughs> um, and and they're they're saying stuff. They're discovering things that teachers are saying. I've never seen this. Nice. nice. So anecdotally, I'm feeling really encouraged mm -hmm. um, uh, when I when I see the harumph and the I'm still not successful. Yeah, that's frustrating and, and, and I think it's important to think about new models. It's important to not have a student feel unsuccessful for so long that it becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. well said. And that's the self-efficacy piece that we've talked about that we're driving for. If I can, if I've got the skills that I come in every day and I can do the challenging things that you're asking of me, I'm going to feel pretty good about myself. Right. And all the other issues and problems that I may have in my life because I'm coming in and I can feel good about this tend to melt a little bit more into the background. Yeah. Won't fix them. Right, right. But, but it makes it but, it. but it gives them an alternative in their directions. Yep. So elementary-wise, 2018, 2017-ish, um, Overall, across the elementary schools, 40% um, ish were hitting proficiency. Right now, it's closer to 60. Nice. Yeah, but it depends on the elementary school. Some are a little higher, some are a little lower, which is normal, and they kind of switch well, back. Well, and the and sample forth. is different yeah. as a result. Right. So the the high school, um, when they switched to having the math in ninth grade they were at about 19 percent proficiency you know give or take a point or two um, currently they're at about 34 35 percent so again it's slow but it's mm -hmm. more it's a it's a big change prospectively um, and again even at the high school when you compare it to like i said the surrounding districts in vermont we're, we're ahead the ones that are surrounding us uh, we did get the, the news week, which was Im impressive for the middle school portion of the high school, um, as one of the best schools in Vermont. And we got Braintree as one of the best schools in Vermont. Yeah. I think Braintree was number two. I think they, they misprinted it in the paper mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, it's number two in the state. It's not number five, if I remember correctly. And so there's been, you know, been a, been a lot of work, and I think it's having an impact. It's just with COVID and everything else, it's taken longer than we hoped. People should be proud of the work we've done. And so unless, yeah, unless, uh, I appreciate the, the, the follow-up conversation, and I apologize for giving you kind of a doozy question, but, you know, that's kind of the goal over the next month is to have that really broad discussion about what do we do when a student doesn't meet the ender, standard by the end of the year um, and try to consolidate all the ideas into, into a structure, into a policy, into a protocol that we can actually put into place to make sure that we're doing the best job that we can to make sure they're prepared for each successive grade that comes their way. 
and process wise you're gonna touch base with your educators right oh yeah <laughs> like yeah. We're, no, not, we're just we are we're just at, we're we are just at the very start we're not, uh, we are yeah <laughs> we are just at the very start like I said there's a there's kind of the district work and I'll be talking about this for the next month month and a half in, with my listening sessions um, that I do at each of the schools so that's where the educators get an opportunity to kind of talk about this and then like I said the um, the principals are working on it through their advisory um, to try to get the best ideas they can from folks in the community and some of the teachers sit on the advisories too and, and we'll bring all that that info back together and create a plan you, you mean like the the new parent advisory groups right yep. yeah and you're you're on that is that right I'm on something in <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, you know that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up this piece. Um, I'm happy if there's uh, questions about anything um, to to talk about, um, and nobody is trapped here. So, but because I know you have a long night, I, I I try to set it up on the same night as um, RUHS, just because if there's people already here, they don't have to make two trips in a week. But okay. yeah, you too. But if if not, I thank you very much. Yeah.